once say bombay is uh, organized and planned maybe south is a little more spontaneous more impulsive and if you were to break it down further into say an ad film or a feature film the ad film would uh, i mean you would lock every single shot before you go on to the shoot which means uh, you would have it storyboarded which is approved by all the heads of departments and it also so happens that with advertising what happens is uh, you would have to get prior approvals from say uh, the agency and the client and you therefore can't deviate much from it once you have locked in onto those uh, set of ideas and set of shots and so then you pretty much follow it all through the shoot but all of this have the pros and cons i mean like uh, it's like i've heard uh, shekhar kapoor on an interview talk about uh, something where he was mentioning the difference between working in india and working abroad he says working abroad is like where you walk into the cool comfort of a supermarket with a list and say you okay this is my grocery okay you pick up four of these uh, and then get into the other division and then uh, pick up a few and then come back with exactly what's there on your list as opposed to going to uh, like a busy uh, market in an indian uh, thing it's dusty people are screaming and uh, you walk in and then suddenly you see hey that's a great bargain let me pick this up uh, this seems uh, like a really good buy let me pick this up and only when you come back home you say oh i didn't even need this or whatever there's a lot of chaos at, at times that happens i think that was a a, a very good uh, observation of how things do work on, on a large uh, level and so in some areas your roles might shrink a bit in some areas it might stretch a bit but bottom line is yeah you still need to be able to achieve what you've set out for so the means might be slightly different and the process might be slightly different between say mumbai and south and also when you shoot abroad i mean a whole lot of shoots that do happen abroad uh, off lay there have been times when uh, i've had to shoot uh, a lot of ad films earlier where it would just not even be my gaffer or my first ac who would travel with me it just would be me and this would be mostly in thailand and uh, i don't speak thai and most of the thai crew doesn't speak uh, uh, english or uh, but after a point you know the first day or so it's a little difficult to communicate things but then you find a way around of how to uh, deal with it and the systems are different so you get around to it and uh, yeah i think that's uh, another thing which i feel is like how do you uh, decide who's a good director who's a good editor who's a good music director or who's a good cook i mean all of this basically boils down to okay you made a great dish one day or you made a great film one day or you had a great tune one day that's good but then it's consistency that's always worked for if you're talking about a, a director then it's the body of work how has he over a period of time managed to do something how has a music director over a lot of films managed to do something i think the same rule kind of applies to cinematographers as well so irrespective of where you shoot how you shoot as long as uh, you are aware that you need to do your best and try and keep it as consistent as possible because nobody really uh, uh, is worried about what issues you had on shoot or uh, how the systems were different or uh, whatever but you just still figure out because the bottom line is you have to do your job your role and how do you figure out the systems and other things and uh, get your work done is i think what it kind of uh, boils down to and also there is uh, this interview from uh, uh the dop who shot uh, raiders of the lost ark and uh, he talks about how they were shooting uh, this chase in egypt and they were losing light and there is a whole uh, action sequence that's left to be shot and they're losing light and so he goes up to the director steven spielberg and he says uh, so we're losing light i don't know how we are going to finish this entire uh, sequence he says don't worry we'll get to it so by the time they got to it they just had about half an hour or 40 minutes left and uh, the entire action would not be done in less than half a day so then he said okay uh, let harrison ford pull out the gun and shoot him and uh, so the continuity girl actually runs up to him and says sir but he never carries a gun 
Indiana Jones never carries a gun. He's just with the whip. He says it doesn't matter. So he pulls out a gun and shoots this guy. And I've seen that film as a as a kid, and I still remember that as one of the most iconic sequences in the film. Like you'd remember the whole thing, and then there's this other guy pulling out his sword, and he just shoots him, and he walks off. So at times, improvement. Yeah, if you are in the right frame of mind, if you can handle it, if you have, if you have the creative bent to it, then yeah, I, I think you can improvise a lot on um, sets. But it does take a toll on uh, the cinematographers. I mean, because you you'd rather be well planned for what's going to come in and where it's going to be there, and what time of the day you'd like to shoot, which uh, sequence in which area, and all of this. But having said all of that, I think yeah, it might be a little easier for us. But the bottom line is the roles are quite well defined. I mean, you as the cinematographer will need to ensure that you uh, somehow kind of uh, get what you think is the best. When you have uh, directors who come in from abroad and uh, or when we go with our crews abroad, they're surprised with the uh, number of people on a set. Like for us, anywhere between 100, 150, 200 is not uncommon. And to get 200 people who might not be uh, precisely trained or whatever to follow a system, it's definitely not an easy thing. And there are times when, I've, when we were shot abroad uh, for things and the entire crew strength would not be more than about 12 to 15 people. So it's a lot more easier to tell them what exactly you need and how to go about it and all of that because everybody is part of the plan all the more important that you don't deviate from plan. You have 15 people, so it's going to take them uh, a lot more time if they were to put something up, set something up. And uh, you, on the day of the shoot, you say, no, I don't want to shoot here. We want to shoot in another location. Then the entire preparation goes for uh, a bit of a toss. So it's, I think, trying to find the balance. I think despite the chaos, I think uh, it, it uh, I think each one is programmed in a different way. I, I think maybe there's some people who can uh, really function very well with a lot of chaos, some people who would like uh, to be very uh, planned and uh, know exactly what's happening after what. Um, so I think those years, I, I think there was this uh, phase in my life where I was only doing advertising. So I think that would may, maybe have been for about four years or five years when uh, I think I was only doing advertising. So at that point, maybe you'd also kind of gotten used to all those tech rickies and being uh, exactly planned. And then you are going in for a shoot, knowing exactly what you're going to be doing. Uh, and then, so at, at times, maybe you think you're maybe programmed slightly uh, differently now because of your exposure to advertising for about five years. And then you have to also be able to absorb some things that, uh, that happen on a shoot on a location. If it's basically your ability to function in the chaos, there will be a lot of times when you've written something as a director and then on the sets you uh, make an improvement that is much better, but maybe you don't have the you don't have the property that's required for it, or maybe you don't have the location for it because it's just come on uh, on the day of shooting. So then how do you still manage to do it? Because you're not going to be able to say, no, uh, we're not going to be shooting today because we've got this idea. Because you're all answerable to the producers and to the production. So how do you make sure that a better idea doesn't get lost because we've just said, okay, we've locked in everything last night and therefore we won't be open to new ideas. So it's kind of a balance. I think it's, uh, I mean, a lot of things that you just keep uh, trying to find the balance and move along. Basically, I would like to uh, start by saying that I've been very lucky with the directors that I've been working with over the years. And uh, in my early phase, at least, there was a lot of uh, uh, areas where I was not very good at. I'm not saying I'm very good at everything even now, but I'm just saying there were maybe a lot more areas where I was still struggling to find a balance. And I would have learned and absorbed a lot from, from each of those directors. And they would have... Uh, a way of dealing with a certain situation in one way. You don't have a location. Let's play it like this. Okay, the actors are not coming. Let's shoot their shots first. So over the years, you 
maybe absorbed a lot from all the directors. And I think every director who is setting out to make a film has a unique vision, has a way of uh, narrative. And he's been dreaming about this film. He's been uh, seeing this film in his head for years or months. Uh, and, and then you step in at, at some point. So I think the primary motive kind of remains uh, clear. I think it is uh, the director's vision. I mean, it's his film. And how do you best help out in the scenario? How do you best step into the picture and make sure that uh, they are able to see the film that they've dreamed about? And off late, it's been a little easier in terms of uh, to most of the directors. Uh, I mean, you. Uh, I mean, they're more friends now, and you tell them, I have my set of weaknesses. It's not that I can do everything very well. And I mean, I'm sure they have their set of weaknesses, certain areas that, uh, I mean, they are not very good with. The art director might not be very good with some things. So I think how as a team, we cover each other's weakness and kind of ensure that it doesn't show on the end product. And yeah, each one has a style. At, at some point, you, you bring in uh, what uh, you think is good for the... Uh, for the film to the table and then you, you broadly assess it if your idea is good maybe it, uh, they would like to follow it or if they have another way of dealing with it then you have to figure out how uh, you can uh, kind of adapt to that and make sure that nothing uh, goes wrong or so that kind of how it works I mean there are uh, times when the director would have dreamt of it for so long and, and then you're coming in fresh on board, maybe a month or two months, uh, which is the kind of uh, prep time that we have here in India. And then how do you ensure that you pull off what he has in his mind or you better it? And there are times when you, you feel, okay, the director maybe is just being so focused on uh, the writing or the narrative that he's not really had enough time to look at uh, the visual style or something. So you can always go on board and say, okay, this is how... Uh, we can better the idea. This is how we can maybe push the thing. Maybe we should look at this kind of references, images. So I think it's a constant collaborative process. It depends. I think it is kind of very fluid in terms of, I think it kind of depends on the director and the project. Some of the films that I've worked with, including Aranya Gandham and Vikram Veda, they've had like a huge... Uh, I, I would say a lot of time before they actually got into shoots. So they might have, uh, like Vikram Veda had about uh, seven years from the time it was written to the time it was made. And all this time they've only been thinking about uh, how they want to uh, present the film, how they want to see a sequence. So it gives you more time to get into every single detail. And... Uh, so some films, okay, a, a few months, I mean, you have to write it and there are uh, there are uh, big actors involved. You might not be able to push it beyond a certain date, so you get on board. Uh, so how do you start uh, figuring out what is your best pitch for the film? And I think it kind of uh, evolves as you go along. I think like it kind of connects to the first uh, thing, like how you uh, find it different between working in Mumbai or uh, South or Ad. I think each director has his own way of working. So it's again a question of adapting and trying to understand what he wants, what he looks at. So maybe look at, talk about a few films in that genre, which maybe both of us can arrive at a common point and say, should we look at something like this? Should we look at, and not that you're going to be following it to the T, but just to say, okay, this is kind of, because it's a very vague term when we say uh, something like, I want it to be very visual. I want it to be very uh, uh well photographed or uh, I mean the cinematography should be good and these are all very generic terms and there's nothing uh, there's no real way of putting a, a peg to it and say okay well, this is what we're talking about so then maybe it's there maybe you exchange a few images look at a few films and say is this the kind of style that we're looking at and and then how you take it forward from there and even on the sets it's a constant uh, process I'm like on between day one to day five uh, you might be understanding the director better. The director might have a better understanding of what your strengths are. So, I, and I think you keep moving along. 
with, uh, with that. According to me, it would just be tools that help you achieve what you want. I mean, if you're a if you're a, an artist, if you're a painter, then it's the kind of brush that you're using, and uh, it might not necessarily be. Uh, the only way to achieve certain things. I mean, there are always uh, ways of going back to something basic. You just might need to work extra hard or you might need to uh, think extra and, and figure it out. Like the days when we were shooting on film, I, at least me and I'm sure a whole lot of other DOPs would have had sleepless nights when you've shot something and till you see the rushes the next day, you're only worried about what could have gone wrong. I mean, you could have... I mean, there have been cases. I mean, uh, there have been cases where uh, uh, the wrong stock has been loaded on to the camera and nobody's even noticed it. So the exposure has gone for a toss. The film could get fogged. Uh, there could be focus issues on the camera. And, and so it kind of gets easier as we keep going along. I think technology kind of makes it easier for you. So from, uh, from those days now, you know exactly what you're getting by the end of the day. So there are no more sleepless nights, so to speak. You know, okay, okay, this is what we've got for the day and this is what it is. Because you're very sure of if, if there is an issue with the camera, if there is some issue with uh, the lens, all of that you can see directly. There's issue with the focus. So it has made uh, it a lot easier on a lot of uh, counts. I think, uh, Samir, if I'm not mistaken, I think Red had a summer workshop for 12-year-old kids. So, which was their way of, I mean, that's one of the, the high-end cameras that they're talking about. It's their way of saying, it's so user-friendly that anybody can uh, get their hands on and it's so user-friendly, you could work on it as well. So, it kind of makes your life easier. And, and in certain cases, maybe say an avatar without the technology would not be possible. Maybe a Jurassic Park wouldn't be possible. So, certain cases, but for most of the narratives, I think it is just a tool and you could uh, figure out how you want to go about it. There are films uh, that have been shot on the iPhone, which have done uh, really well and they've gone to international festivals. And there are films on uh, using the, the best equipment that are also doing well. So bottom line is, I think it's again, what are films? And uh, when it comes to films, it's just, you know, it's a narrative. You're telling a story idea. You're telling... Uh, uh, a fictionalized story. So after the first few minutes, I don't think the resolution is really, you just, your eye gets used to it. I, I think your eye gets used to it and say, okay, hey, as long as the narrative thread is intact, then I think the, the high-end cameras versus mid-level cameras is not going to make such a big difference for a film. Uh, and yeah, you might need to put in more uh, you might need to put in more energy of trying to figure out how to go about it. Now, when you look back and say, hey, how did production managers function without mobile phones earlier? They functioned and they did extremely well. I mean, so just now it becomes unthinkable. How do you do that? You're looking at a Mughali Azam today and I've seen it in the theater, the restored version. I'm looking at the, the song sequence in the glass hall and saying, how did they manage to do that? I mean, to me now, if you were to give that, I'd say, okay, get CG to erase everything. I mean, there needs to be lights, there needs to be a crew, there needs to be a camera. How do you shoot into a glass hall with uh, so many curves around it and, and there's no reflection? So you would have to have worked extra hard, maybe put in more time, but there's always a way of doing it. You look at 2001 Space Odyssey, it's like decades ago. And it still blows your mind in terms of, oh my God, how did they achieve it? So it's not so much about technology as opposed to how you use it and how at times you figure out a way around it. Like I'm saying, it's the same thing. I mean, just in terms of, okay, if there were no mobiles and how do you function? Okay, there'll be some other way of doing it. There's some other way of communication. So this, uh, this is important for certain things. And it's also kind of maybe important in terms of uh, what the consumption pattern is going to be going into the future. Like you're talking about HDs and okay, some of this might not be good enough to survive the test. So more on the consumption pattern, but to do with the creatives and to do with the, nar uh, the narratives, I don't think the technology is like, uh, is like a deal breaker. I think it kind of, you, you might have to work extra hard. You might have to figure out 
an alternate way of doing it but uh, otherwise i think it's it's just tools that make your life easy and uh, in certain cases yeah to get what you envision come true for one of the films that we are working on pon vikram veda the opening sequence uh, so there's a single shot of uh, people starting uh, near a vehicle walking through uh, an area and then climbing up the stairs and then going into the first floor and then they move into uh, the room so it's like a single shot going up from uh, it's a really long take starting somewhere and going up and then moving in i mean there are uh, really the new end uh, cranes and other things with, with which we can pretty much do the shot but then we didn't have the budget or uh, the availability of the equipment but we still wanted to get the shot done and uh, we were trying it out on a test shoot on a day and uh, surprisingly the uh, the crane operator he comes to me and he says i think i i know a way to do it and then he tells me something which kind of i didn't buy it when he told me this he said is do you even think this is going to work but anyway i said okay let's give it a try and then it worked out well yeah. and uh, so, so i'm saying yeah we had to work extra hard we had uh, another half a day of prep for it and then gave him a date for him to figure out what he was doing and then he did another test so you might need to work extra hard or put in those extra things but but technology itself can't be uh, the reason for achieving something good i think it all boils down to also the cost i think uh, 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 on the bigger ones you might have the luxury of keeping a lot of equipment and then using it if need be because that's not going to really pinch uh, the budget of the film taking the scale of the project into uh, but on a smaller film every single light that you add on might actually start eating into the budget i mean you will you need to make a compromise somewhere else. so if you're very precise about how you plan for it you're saying okay this this is the day then okay i'll do all the outdoor maybe once and maybe move in indoor on another day and do those shots so maybe we can call the lights on the second day and uh, maybe we'll call for steady cam on one day and try and finish those shots so if you're well planned i think you can always uh, overcome it and and i'm saying okay suppose you don't have a budget for a steady cam okay you don't even have budget for a day and you still want to try something then maybe you'll try handle maybe you'll try something else or maybe and, and there are always ways to uh, i mean there's a easy way with technology of how to do it which might be more expensive and there might be a another way of achieving it with lesser cost or let us train and but with more thought like i look at some of those shots on i am cuba you know some of you have seen it is a old soviet uh, feature some of those single shots just go on and they're so seamless and it starts in the top floor comes down to the pool and then moves somewhere else goes through a tobacco factory i'm saying and this is in black and white and how do you even achieve it and there's no it's like okay it's all images have been stabilized they're so smooth and so they have figured a way out and now when you look at it it's the same like i was talking earlier about mogli azam or uh, space odyssey how do you go about it it's just not technology that's done it it's about the vision and saying okay, it basically technology is nothing but the tools for you to make your vision come true yeah i mean okay this is what i have in and how do i go about it except very few instances like i was talking about maybe an avatar or a jurassic park which would be difficult without uh, the cutting edge technology but otherwise most 90% of it technology is not of the of the top priority have been kind of uh, broken down to either the red or uh, the alexa and uh, and right now i think a lot of films or in fact in fact all films would have a lot of uh, uh, like a gopro or a 5d all these smaller things which you need to do a rig or you need to do an action sequence so you have a lot of mixed format that's uh, part of every film and the primary thing would be okay you would uh, look at okay are you going to be looking at multiple cameras okay do we have enough cameras to go with to start with i mean on a day of uh, uh, the shoot i mean you're going to be using four cameras and can we get the same cameras and the same set of lenses for things and in certain cases you're talking about a lot of handle you're talking about a lot, a lot of uh, confined spaces like there was this uh, film called david which uh, was one of the uh, the dopes 
and lot of that uh, was handled a lot of it was handled a lot of it is in confined spaces we were shooting in spaces the entire family is sitting in a room which must be about uh, 8 by 10 So by the time the camera goes in, I mean, there's pretty much the family and the cameraman. There's nobody else. Even the director has to wait also. That's the kind of chores in Bombay. So then you'd uh, like to have your camera size to be smaller. You'd like it to be more uh, lighter. So maybe you'd go. And so we had to shoot that on. I mean, we shot that on the red because it was a lot lighter to do uh, handles and it was uh, easier. And, and in terms of the final, uh, in terms of the final output, I think. not very many films are very true to uh, what they've been shot with in terms of uh, i think the post kind of gives you enough leeway for you to maneuver around your uh, images so that you can finally get to your desired uh, look kind of uh, fairly uh, easily so i think it's kind of uh, easier on that front so i don't think it's to do as much to do with the final uh, output and also i think now again like i was talking earlier the final consumption patterns going into say the next uh, few years on ott i mean okay is this going to pass the ott test in terms of okay is it the minimum resolution that's required and you would rather be safe i mean way the way they are upgrading stuff you would rather be safe so that's pretty much how it would boil down no obviously each camera comes with it with its uh, strength and weakness you know you can take like me talking about the gopro or you talking about uh, uh, the other smaller cameras i mean the strength would be their size and their ability to and their cost so in terms of you want to put it right in the middle of action and you want uh, uh, to take a chance with it even if the camera does get damaged then you're not really getting too worried about it and it might be a practical decision of how you want to do it now what you uh, would try and do is okay your best image which would be from your main camera say on that uh, film or say your alexa now how do you match the this footage to that and uh, since most of it is on action you would uh, try and get the alexa look first and then try and match it as close to it as possible the primary role would definitely be capturing the images on the thing and making sure that the director is now uh, the other thing that i've that i've told samir and uh, others earlier also is that what is how do you define a good uh, a frame in a film i'm say what what's a good frame so it need it's a combination of say maybe a, a person in a good costume sitting in good light in a good location so unless all of these things come in uh, together then you are not going to be able to get a good frame so when you are talking about a good costume so then you need to be able to communicate this with the costume designer when you are talking about a good set you will need to be able to communicate this with the art director and good light i mean you should be able to uh, plan it out with the director and say we'll need to shoot this at this light for it to look magical or for it to look good uh, uh so i think it basically boils down to how much you're willing what is the role that you're willing to take on apart from just i mean you're not just going to go there and say okay let's start shooting this and then you start uh, shooting it then you'll need to start prepping for it and and tell him okay this is the end desired result that we would like to achieve and for this we need the support of the costume designer you need the support of the production designer you need the producers to back you you need the director to help you uh, plan it out so you need to start touching on all these areas and I, uh, there was this phase earlier which is the same with this and i'm just saying like i think for editors it was such a technical skill and then uh, then the steam packs and the avids and all these came in it became such a uh, from being uh, a very difficult uh, I mean, you had to physically handhold the frames and all that. So it used to be like a, a trick; only very few editors could do it. And then it became like, okay, you just need to press a knob, and then it comes to the perfect frame. And and you're not physically cutting the film, throwing it away, looking at the rushes again, and then pulling it back and uh, looking at which shot you threw away. You just go back to the delete bin and you open up. So from saying, from say having about uh, 50 editors, there was this phase when there were maybe about suddenly a, a, a mushroom of 500 editors. because anybody who had the basic skills on edit could become an editor I mean, how do you define an editor it's the same with cinematographers now i mean like, how do you define a cinematographer 
like I was saying, Red has a workshop for a 12-year-old. So it's become so user-friendly. So there'll be times when a director can easily shoot a film if he so wishes. There's no real technicalities attached as opposed to maybe two decades ago where, oh, I don't know what emulsion to use. I don't know whether you need to push process it, whether you need to take it into the lab and whether you need to go through the, the DA. Pretty much what you're seeing on the monitor is, is what you're... Uh, basically uh, recording and then you could take it to the DI and then you can tell him, no, I want to try this look, I want to try that look and you can sit on it. So what is it that, that you bring in apart from just the technical skills? I mean, that's the more important part, I think, going forward and even currently, I think it's, it's how do you associate yourself with the narrative in terms of how do you uh, help the director in terms of, okay, uh, a dolly is a better uh, thing to be doing here. A handle is a better thing to be doing here. I think we should be on a wide angle lens and closer to the actor and not on a zoom and further away from the actor. All these calls, which are going to have some emotional bearing on the image. I mean, you want the uh, audience to feel like you're in the midst of the scene. So therefore we need to be in the wide and be in close. And how do you uh, help him in his vision? That's going to be the, the more important role. The technicalities are kind of a lot easy today, a lot easier today I'm saying, compared to what it was a few uh, decades ago. So there, it, you definitely needed the technical expertise uh, on uh, on a larger scale than today. Today, it's the technical expertise is there, but I think it's also the uh, the artistic things of how to make the narrative better? How do you make the narrative connect? How do you make the narrative more emotional? How do you make the narrative work? I mean, that's where I think the role kind of uh, is on uh, these days. It's also about how you use the tools, how you use the technology, how you for uh, to further the narrative. Like I'm saying on a film like Polar Express, which is the uh, animated one, you still have a, a real-time DOP on it. He's not going to be doing any of those things, but he's still going to be checking, okay, what kind of light will aid the mood? How do you enhance the mood? What kind of lensing uh, would be right? I mean, okay, if you were to be close to the actor, do you need to be further away from the actor for you to achieve the desired effect you have in your mind? So I think it's after a point how you use uh, the, the tools to enhance the mood on one level. That was one of the easiest action sequences or action sequences in a film that I've ever shot. And that's primarily because I think the kind of uh, preparation that uh, Bob Brown had done on the thing, I think they were here for close to a month or a month and a half prepping every single detail. And they knew at what speed the cars would be running, they would knew what shots would be coming. They had done the entire shoot and they edited out uh, the stuff. So we knew the exact length of the shot, and when I first came on board and they said, uh, we're planning this for about uh, 26 days. Uh, and I told the producer, I said, with all this action, I don't think this is going to be a 26 day shoot. Now, again, most of what you assume is based on what your past experiences have been. So my past experiences with action have always been, okay, you plan for a few days and then it always shoots up. And looking at the load of work, I said, this is definitely not a 26 day shoot. I think another plus 10 definitely seems on. So if you can finish it under 40 days, then I think we should be happy for the volume of action that was there. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think we finished it in the exact 26 days and then they uh, shot a few shots the next morning because of something that they'd missed, but they're so precise. And there would be times when we would finish early in a day. We would start it and there was no chaos. I mean, there was no screaming. Everybody was on their walkies. Everybody knew precisely what to do. And we had uh, maybe about 40 to 50 cars on a highway. Everybody was told exactly what to do. Like, this is another good uh, uh, case of what we were talking about earlier, about when you work in different setups, like, say, Mumbai or here. I mean, here's this action director who's come from uh, Hollywood with his way of functioning, the terminology is different, uh, the crew is different, the way, and like I said before, here we are 150 of us, the crew members, he doesn't know who's who, and, and how do you still ensure that he gets his action right? Okay, they've planned for it. How do you foolproof it? And so every single detail was taken into account. They had gone into the terrace, they had got the people to do the jumps, 
we we shot all of it and so and uh, they would, like I was mentioning earlier there were times when we had finished at 3 and 4 in the afternoon we'd still have about 2 hours and then I would tell the director Vikram I would say are we sure we've got everything should we ask for a few more extra shots and then we would go to Bob and say do we need to get no we are done for the day we are good we in fact got one shot from uh, the next day as well today and so we would look at each other say okay and then we would but it was so precise and it was such a pleasure doing it because it was it, it there was most of the work was done before the shoot which is the way uh, most of the international shoots happen like i've heard uh, as spielberg mentioned this on an interview where he says 80% of my work happens before the shoot for us i think uh, in the indian context uh, maybe about 90% happens on the day of the shoot I, I mean, a whole lot of it happens on the day of the shoot and which is the way we i mean we used to that I mean, so but that was really nice on uh, on hello working on the action and then we managed to finish everything on schedule and with exactly what we wanted uh, with a few extra shots uh, which we thought we should have in any ways and uh, and otherwise we were uh, it was uh, it was really good experience We will have to. Because right now, I think the smaller films still might have a lot more uh, uh, prep and a lot more planning because they don't have the uh, buffer budgets to take care of. Say, okay, I am not happy with certain things. We we might need to reshoot some things. It's not something that they want. And once you're taken off. some comfort zone then you automatically something will else will need to fill it in so you would guess you would have to work harder put your edit together and then look at it and make sure okay everything is intact before you go in for your uh, shoot but even on the bigger ones i think yeah we will have to, i mean apart from just the uh, uh, the the apart from just the money front i think even otherwise i think we are moving towards that it, it, atmosphere changes when i think it's uh, and when i'm saying atmosphere changes i think it still needs to be uh, something that you can't ignore i mean you're talking about uh, same thing when a film like arjun reddy gets made or uh, some of these uh, the new wave films get made and everybody takes notice of it and then you say it's not so important to have uh, what the so called parameters of commercial cinema for it to work and all of that so similarly yeah, i think the new blood definitely will uh, will will come in with their fresh set of ideas and uh, the film schools yeah they they could help but they would be more on the technical and on the creative fronts and in terms of uh, this basically the logistics i think more i think the production will need to start ensuring that the people are more accountable more answerable i think it it will get there i mean yeah. i think it would be one of the easiest films that i have shot uh and the wow to me happened when i heard the script i mean i'm meeting this uh, director who's also a friend uh, you know from before we worked and uh, he says i have this idea for a script and so i'm like okay what is he going to tell me and then as i start hearing the script i'm saying oh this is something and uh, and then we started uh, prepping for it and the film was meant to happen and then and then there were issues and then finally from the time i heard the script to the time it got made they must have been at least like a two year lull when the initial set of producers had uh, some reservations and then somebody else had to step in and then and then it finally came back to the original producer again saying okay i am ready for it so it gave us enough time to kind of uh, just look at common interest more than anything else in terms of i don't think we've really sat down and said uh, this is the kind of pitch this is the kind of parameter this is what it is we would just keep throwing ideas and talk about films and talk about common films that we like and and, and as we uh, moved along uh, then we uh, kind of found a pitch for the film and as we were shooting it we were uh, figuring out stuff like for instance there's the set in the film which is uh, where the entire uh, which is jackie shop's house in the film and both of us were uh, talking about it one day and i said uh, i have an issue with the set uh, 
the real location that we wanted to shoot in, uh, we had shot one portion of it and then it was kind of being broken down and we couldn't enter the house. So there was no option. We couldn't shoot in the real location. So we're talking about how we will have to make a set. Um, then I said, there's something about the set which is always a giveaway, especially on a film like this. You don't want it to look like a set. So he said, yeah, I definitely don't want it to look like a set. So we were talking about it. He said, then I came back to him after a day or two. I said, I know what one of the issues is. So he said, what? I think you end up lighting a set a lot more. You give yourself the safety provisions. Okay, make this wall movable. Let it move back about 10 feet. Uh, give me provision on the top for me. Light it from top. And uh, so I think let's pull away all those parameters. All the safety parameters. Let's shoot it like you're shooting in a real house. So he said, yeah, that's, uh, yeah that sounds good uh, to me. Then I said, okay, there is a catch. I can light people who are near the windows. I can, I'm not going to be bringing in any lights into the set. I'll light it from outside. But then there are going to be areas that are dark. There's going to be fallouts. You might not see certain people. He said, I am completely okay with it. I think it will help the film. But that, see, for me to uh, say we could do this or for us to collaborate on it, okay. But it needs the director to be able to say, I can see what you're talking about and we'll go with it. And it, it, it was like a, a fraction of a second before he said, yeah, I think that sounds good. Let's let's try it out. So whatever interiors we have shot is in a set, but I think it doesn't, I mean, at least to me, it doesn't really look like a set because it doesn't have the giveaways of a set. For a set, you normally look, oh, it's been top lit. So, okay, there's a light somewhere there. So it, it, it is more true uh, to where the windows are. It, it, it's more true to where uh, the light sources are. So I think those kind of things, so I think it became kind of uh, easy enough. And then the, and again, another case of where he's been with that idea for, uh, I, I, I don't know, I'm not too sure of the exact time, but maybe more than about four to five years. So he's seen those locations. He has, uh, uh, every uh, scene has the location uh, already marked out. I mean, by the time we got down to making it, most lot of those locations were either broken down or there was, there, was a, there was a train station where we wanted to stage the climax that was broken and then it was, uh, there was a new conflict that had come up. There were some that got changed over the making of the movie. And also, I think, getting into uh, which at that point, I mean, I never shot in North Chennai, always have always been in Chennai. That's uh, more like uh, the old city, but not as... Uh, uh, exposed in films as much as maybe Old City in Hyderabad is, but North Chennai is not something that was so exposed, but it had all these uh, beautifully painted walls and alleys and, and darkness. And uh, Arne Kandam is again uh, another film which happened after a lot of years of advertising. So in advertising, there is a lot of, uh, I think, preset looks. I mean, you can't really... Uh, uh, stretch the boundaries on advertising looks. I mean, it needs to be cosmetic most of the time. It needs to look beautiful. It needs to look glossy. So every time there's been a lot of advertising and then you come back to this. So I think it just excites you in terms of trying to see, okay, there's so much of darkness and oh, oh you cannot, uh, you don't need to light anything there. You can just play with darkness. I, mean, I don't know whether it was all and Telugu films that I've worked in or, or uh, the difference between say Arne Kandam and Ala Vaikuntapuram or Manam would be starkly different. I think it is more to do with what the script definitely demands. When you read it Arne Kandam, you know it needs to be gritty, you know it needs to be true. Each one I think has a certain uh, graph quite clearly indicated in the script. When you read Manam or when you read Ala Vaikuntapuram or Ukri, then you know okay it's meant to be glossy, it's meant to be rich, it's meant to be, uh, uh, it's meant to be more uh, brighter and happier kind of a thing. So I think maybe the script kind of uh, demands it on one level and songs, uh, yeah, songs, I think, uh, the other thing I feel more with most Indian films is you could have shot the film really well over 80 days and then you would shot, uh, you would have shot the uh, songs for about 20 days. But the 20 days is what's going to be, keep, I mean, it's going to be repeated. It's going to get the most uh, eyeballs in terms of TV, YouTube or whatever. The most repeat is that and a whole lot of it based on that. So, uh, so I think, I think in the Indian context, it's, uh, it's kind of important 
to make sure that you do pay a lot of attention to the songs. And uh, all said and done, I think we've also been a little lucky with the kind of songs that uh, some of the songs that have come our way and uh, you just ensure or at least you put in your best to make sure that uh, you do the best you can on the songs in terms of how do you have a recall value? How do you ensure that this song doesn't uh, become like 10 other songs? I'm not saying most of the songs that uh, we've shot are therefore standing out, but but at least that's the attempt behind it. Whether you've succeeded or not is another uh, story altogether. But at least in the thing you say, okay, this is something that's going to be watched a lot. Uh, and how do you ensure that it uh, kind of uh, has some kind of recall when you think of, uh, say, a Chaya Chaya. I mean, those are those are iconic. I mean, I'm not saying anywhere, but just on to think, I mean, you immediately think of a train or when you talk about something else, you think of the car headlights that we're uh, shot. So, I mean, how do you kind of give some definition to the song and ensure that you do justice to uh, the song? You know, Arnya Kandam can't be set in a very glossy uh, uh, setup. You, you know, Vikram Veda. I mean, you might take away the strength of the script. I'm saying by going against the grain of the script. And uh, with a lot of the mainstream uh, films, you also need to ensure that your actors look good. And uh, actors look good, so you might need to be more glossier. You might need to be more uh, uh, rich in that, in that sense, in terms of your... Uh, and I think also kind of... Uh, boils down to what kind of milieu, what kind of a setting the film is based on, okay. I mean, most of uh, the Telugu films that I've worked on have a very rich house and uh, they're all rich people. So I think it, the, the, it also boils down to the stories of the rich versus like somebody in Arane Kandam who's staying in a small house somewhere. So I think it kind of, I think it's tr being more true to the narrative than anything else. Yes, we definitely will. Like for any artist, I mean, the director and kind of uh, his personal likes. I'm saying it might boil down to a whole lot of things. It might be to do with the fact if I'm a director, I'll make the kind of films that I enjoy watching. If I am a cinematographer, I'll try and uh, emulate or try and follow uh, certain frames that I've liked. So each one's taste would differ. So it, it would kind of boil down to Yes, your personal tastes and preferences would come into play. I mean, it, uh, and at the same time, it, it's very important to not do that. It, it's a combination of both. Now, if you don't bring in your personality and if you don't bring in your personal taste, then it kind of takes away what is unique to you. You bring in some value to the, uh, to the frame or to the film, and that is your personality. At the same time, it can't be overbearing on the narrative. Like I might be a person who uh, wears a uh, certain kind of clothes and I would, therefore it's easier for me to understand those colors or those costumes better. But if I'm talking about a character who's not in that uh, kind of a space and who needs to wear something that is extremely loud, extremely garish, and uh, he needs to have a certain flamboyant. So it's somewhere, I think, striking a balance between what you bring to the project and what the script demands. I think kind of finding... I think it's again a uh, shrink and stretch scenario. Sometimes when you think, okay, it, this can up, this can take more of what I feel is my personal take on it, and this needs more of the character traits than anything else. So I think it's kind of a constant uh, uh, movement between trying to find the balance. But yeah, I think it is both are equally important. I and mean, you definitely need to be able to bring something onto the project. Otherwise, then what is your eye? Uh, you know, thing? How do you? have uh, something, I'm not saying something which is your signature and something that is your uh, thing, which is uh, which is not really uh, that true to the script because every film can't look like the way uh, your previous films are looking or it, it can't have one signature which is beyond the script or beyond the characters. They need to be more important and then you always add to it with your personal likes and dislikes. Is a special film.
I think it was a wonderful chance to work with uh, with all three generations of uh, the family, which is kind of very unique. When I heard the script, uh, Vikram, I was I was really impressed with the script, and I definitely wanted to be part of the project. And uh, and working was uh, was really uh, kind of very interesting to see uh, Aina serve as a legend. The way, I mean, you could clearly see how important discipline was at that uh, in that era. I mean, it could be to do with practical reasons, but uh, he would stand in when I was lighting. I mean, he would not uh, let one of my assistants stand in and light him. He says his face and my face are different. So isn't it better that I stand there so that you know how to light uh, my face? And it would put us all more at pressure because you don't want uh, him uh, standing there for 15 to, while you're tweaking your lights. And after a point, I would say, no, so he said, no, no, you do your job and you don't worry about this. And there have been times when, uh, I mean, there's this particular day when we uh, had a plan to start shooting with him and we'd given him a call time at nine o'clock and at 8.15, we both, Mikram and me are talking about it. He said, okay, why don't we shoot ANR sir's portions later in the day? And let's start with something else. Uh, we said, okay. So we call uh, the manager. We said, can you please tell Aina, sir, that we are starting a shot uh, later in the day. He can come in later. This was at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And so the manager comes back. He says, already in his makeup room and he's already has the makeup on. It was at 8. We were not expecting him to come that early. And then he said, uh, then uh, the director, I think, walked up to him and he said, sorry, sir, I think we're planning to shoot it much later in the day so you can maybe go home. And he said, no, you've given me a call time of nine. I'm here. Now, what you want to do with me for the rest of the day is up to you. I'm here. I'm happy in the makeup room. So in terms of trying to uh, understand how important it was for, uh, uh, for actors to have that kind of a discipline, and it was, it was, it was quite an experience working on it. And the production itself, I think it's been my most comfortable uh, shoot ever. I mean, ever. In, in, um, like I've told the producers this, uh, Mark sir was really nice on the shoot and, and uh, Supriya and all of them. And we've, I've actually told them, I said, after 105 days of shoot, I was ready to start work on my next feature on the next, uh, very next day. Because it, it was not taxing, it was very relaxed and... And uh, I don't know, it was, it just kind of all came together. There were times in, uh, for the Mysore Outdoor, when, um, which is the uh, Nagsa's flashback portions. And we went there, and this is again another classic case of when sometimes you should be ready to adapt. We go around looking for uh, green uh, paddy fields, which is part of the narrative requirement. So me and Vikram, we go to Pulachi, then we go to Tengasi. Then we go to Kerala and we are trying to look at all these uh, things and it's not the season for paddy. So most of the places, the harvest is already done. So he's saying, we can't wait that long. Let's And then somebody says, okay, Mysore might have, they pretty much the last to have a harvest. So why don't you try Mysore? So we go there and yeah, they've still not harvested it, but they're going to be harvesting it very soon. So I think the production speaks to them and asks them not to harvest the paddy and hold on for a few days till we shoot. And we, uh, so the prep is done. We've come back to Hyderabad. We've shot some other stuff. We're going back to Mysore. And we see there's no more green fields anywhere. The paddy is all brown. It's all golden. So this is what happened. They said, yeah, because they have not harvested it because we've asked them to stop. But, but then it's all dried up. It's all yeah. another color. So he looks at me and says, it's not brown. I said, yeah, is it not green? I said, yeah, it's not green. So now what do we do? So then we said, okay, let's shoot it. It might look different. And it was not a conscious call. It was something that just uh, fell upon us. And we were, I think, uh, uh, maybe, uh, I, I don't know if smart is the right word, but we, we said, okay, this will look different. So let's go with it. And in the end, it all added up so well because the car that Nagsa uses in the, in the film is again a very light uh, beige kind of a thing, like against the golden fields and it was an imagery that kind of looked very different, 
as opposed to if you had done it in the green fields. Now, when you look back at it, it would have looked like another film. And so we went to Naksa. We said, uh, Naksa, generally we know that uh, you don't like to uh, be called early enough for a shoot, but is it possible just for these 10 days to start shooting early so we get good backlight in the morning and then the evening and then the afternoons we can take some time off. He said, yeah, if, if that's going to look better for the film, I'm, I'm game for it. So for the entire chunk, we were shooting early in the day, take a break and then shoot much later in the evening. I think it, uh, and Vikram had used the word when he was, uh, when he finished uh, telling me the script and when we were talking about how to visually approach it and he said, I don't know, the word for, uh, uh, for it is magical is what he told me. So every time the joke, I mean, it would almost become a gag and say, we would set up a frame and say, this is magical, this is magical enough. So, but I think a little bit of it from whatever the jokes are part, it, it did have a little bit of a magical uh, fairy tale-ish kind of a thing, which is like a, like a nice uh, combination of something that was commercially viable at the same time, which was still something that uh, was very personal. And so it was, it will always be one of those uh, special films. Like I was saying, what makes a good picture is one of the more kind of talking about fashion design or whatever. The color palette definitely, definitely plays like a big role in uh, you. I mean, you look at any uh, paintings or any piece of art, or anything. so what uh, colors are being used, what colors are not being used, what colors are being used for a certain mood. I mean, it, it, in terms of either to elevate a mood, in terms of to create a mood, in terms of, uh, or even it just in terms of. Uh, not making it a mishmash of uh, things. I, I think generally in India, I think we do have a lot of color. Like if you look at most of the films uh, that are set abroad, inherently you're talking about maybe blacks and grays and whites. And so it's so muted. For us, we have uh, like a riot of color. So how do you ensure that it uh, doesn't become an overload for you? So you're not even able to pick out a color. Because there is so much of them that uh, you don't know what to pick from a frame. So I think it's nice to maybe have some kind of uh, a filter where you say, okay, these are colors that can find, uh, I'm saying on an aesthetic level in terms of, okay, these can find way into the frame and these we should avoid. whether it is independent or uh, whether it is uh, commercial, I think the, uh, I think it's more true to the script more than uh, uh, true to the, uh, I mean, uh, whether it's commercial or independent, I think it's more to what the script demands more than uh, what the uh, kind of film demands. I think it's more to do with what the script or the narrative demands. Super Deluxe it is another one of those films that was fairly easy to uh, shoot and uh, in all uh, honesty I think uh, the credit would go to the director. I mean he had done a whole lot of background uh, things and he had come up with it so we would maybe mutually uh, talk about it and tweak it a bit but most of the homework there was done by uh, Kumar. I think he had come up with those uh, colors and then we would at times change things to say, okay, this works or this doesn't work in this particular context. But most of that work was done and it was kind of, we just had to hop onto the bandwagon there. I think we are all trying to uh, assess the situation at this point, but uh, it depends. I think the answer would be as good as saying, uh, when is COVID going to go away? So I think it depends on how long it's going to stay and uh, if it's going to be there for a the long term, then I think you would see a lot of uh, masks and PPU suits on sets, which I don't know how it's going to work. But yeah, I think if that's the only way, then I think you would be, have to do that. But uh, the other thing is going to be, I think maybe again, the consumption pattern of, I mean, yes, entertainment is going to remain, filmmaking is going to remain, but... Uh, are the audience going to be lapping it up more in the theaters or is it going to be more uh, on the OTT so that, and therefore what are the kind of films and what are the kind of, uh, I mean, does the language differ slightly in terms of for, uh, I mean, when it's not so much for the large screen as opposed to TVs, those kind of things would come into picture. The practicals, I don't think anybody really has any.
are all of us, I think we've kind of started with photography. I think if you're good with photography, then uh, you're talking about the next logical step, which would be similar to okay, I mean, if, if that interests you, it would be like a series of uh, still images, so to speak. And then you would have to factor in, I think, maybe uh, uh, two things, which is, I mean, instead of it just being still, uh, you know, where the subject is no more still and the subject might be walking, and then you would have to figure out camera moves and things like that. So the best thing, I think, is to start watching films and reading about it. So I think that would be really good. I could be wrong there, but it could be, but it's not generally like, uh, like I've seen a lot of directors become, a uh, lot of editors becoming directors and okay, they know what to hold and what not to hold. And there have been cinematographers who uh, become directors. But I think it's two parallel things. I don't really know why, uh, I mean, you could, and there's technically, yeah, you could. As long as you're interested in, in both, and there's no real reason not to. There is some bit of an ambient light, and you're talking about a city uh, escape. Uh, then, okay, there is some bit of an overhead lamp, and there's one street light somewhere that's. Uh, so, what becomes your key? Uh, and if you're talking about uh, sequences which are. Uh, uh, completely happening where there is no light at all, which is meant to be your simulated moonlight. Then I think there are various ways of uh, going about it and uh, how do you make it look unlit in terms of then you would, the general default go to and how you interpret it might be different, but the general default go to would be the moonlit look, which would you would have some kind of a large uh, source which kind of is meant to simulate the moonlight or something like it. And, so to speak. And, and if you're okay with it, then you can always have it even more underlit, depending on what your sequence demands, could be underlit and then a few passing cars could light it. So it depends on where it is set, how it is set, and what is the point of the scene. So really not that like a lighting background, so to speak. So as much as I've spoken about prep and the planning, I think it also does apply to somebody like me, I mean, like, uh, there were times when maybe you would have certain, something in your, uh, in your head and about how you want it to look and how you want to light it. And then you finish lighting it and you realize it's not working at all. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you know, like, okay, this is just not the way you had imagined it to be. You thought you would place a light at an X angle and then something else, it will kind of look a certain way. There are times when we could be wrong and then it ends up looking not like what you'd imagined it to be, then you have to quickly move around and, uh, and yeah, you might not have a lighting idea, but you'd have like a, like a, a basic uh, broad based idea of what you want the imagery to look like and what is the contrast level that you want to go with uh, based on the location and the moon and the scene and other things. But it wouldn't be like a very specific. Uh, just on a small transitional growth. I mean, okay, this is not uh, something that, and therefore I say, okay, do it the way you would if you were shooting your film. Bring that seriousness onto a project. And do, I mean, if you were shooting your film, would this be as serious as you get or would you be more serious about it? And definitely disciplined uh, and focused. I think it's uh, very difficult uh, to just do it uh, I mean, for a few months and see how it goes and all that. I said, at least give it about two years because that's uh, as much time uh, where it would help you and it would also help us. I mean, it would take that much uh, for you to observe the right things. And I'm not saying it will teach you what to do, but at least you definitely know what not to do on a lot of occasions. And you'll say, okay, this is something that they have done, but I don't agree with it. For you to be able to judge that, I think you'll need at least uh, a couple of years for you to say, okay, this is something that I think I would like to follow. This is, these are definitely things that I would avoid if, when I become a similar group. So it should also help them in their journey. Yeah, a little bit of time in terms of, I think for the first few weeks or months, you're going to be running around so much on a set 
you would hardly have i'm i'm sure samir would agree i mean samir on his first film might not have have realized where the lights are because you would be somewhere bo- a little bottom of the line where you'd have to do most of the running around and then you move up the thing and then it comes to a point where you can now start observing things like you're saying when when it's the, the point i'm saying uh, for most of the film students i mean they've had the training for us when we started off we didn't have the training in terms of uh, film was really expensive so there's no way you're going to be uh, rolling out a few rolls of film and then taking it to the lab processing it viewing it now you can take your camera you can shoot something you can figure out for yourself what works for you what doesn't work for you and therefore the uh, uh the aim of assisting somebody would would be a little more focused i'm saying it's not so much about the technicalities like i'm uh, i've told this to samir i've told this to a few other uh, assistants i've said they might have an edge when it comes to uh, uh, a technology or way their lighting because they're not used to a certain school of thing like i might be coming from my uh, set of uh, large lights of hmi from before because i know i've been using it from before and it's just maybe not so relevant anymore but i just know i mean i'm just more comfortable with them so i think it's for them to also come to a thing and saying they're doing it a certain way but it doesn't necessarily need to be done that way like i'm saying for instance i can have 10 big lights and then i can diffuse it so much put so many layers in front and final output could be uh, that of a tube light and samir might just walk in with a tube light and say i can do the same with this so i think it's for for them to understand okay they're doing it a certain way but that doesn't mean that's the right or the only way to go about it how would i mean what can i do to it and they are there's so much uh, available today for them to experiment i mean there's i mean the information at uh, the fingertips i mean you have videos uh, and there are movies everything is so accessible that it's uh, i mean this at most it can teach two things one is okay how films uh, are being made today and they need to question if this is the way they want to take it forward or they want to figure out their own way and secondly how is it on a commercial setup on more practical uh, things okay how is it interacting with a mainstream director how is it interacting with a mainstream actor how is it uh, uh, working with uh, 20 actors and how do you still get what you want in the, how do you stage a scene those are inputs that that might be of some help which they can look at